Uh, my name is Sergey, and I'm going to be talking about uh, clean code for data science and data transformations. Uh, yeah, I got uh, like 10, 10 years uh, in software, uh, focusing focusing a lot on domain-driven design, uh, testing, and clean code. And uh, having mathematical background, I, I'm kind of patient in uh, data stuff, so I'm doing some data projects and uh, real projects in uh, data engineering. And currently I'm on a project uh, where, I, where I'm asked to uh, kind of train data uh, engineers and data analysts best practices from software engineering that are, that are applicable uh, for their job. And that is very exciting. So uh, this talk is basically summarizing that uh practical experience uh so what i'm gonna be talking about so yeah first uh so we have i assume mixed audience here with uh software engineers and uh, some uh data folks so i will just walk through uh how machine learning flow looks like and where where is the code there uh clean code uh hits for hints for data science and yeah, very interesting questions. Uh, how to organize uh, our code base for for data engineering? That, that's like kind of all er uh, this similar area. I'll talk in a few moments about that. Uh, the cycle of productization of the code. So, uh, data science process consists of exploration phase and a productization phase. So uh, how do we uh, productize our exploration code and practice? Uh, then if we, we have time, we can uh, have a quick QA at that point. And then I have kind of half-life demo, uh, pre-recorded uh, refactoring session, uh, which gonna be interesting to see all these things in action. And then, yeah, uh, q &A. So let's start. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, David Tan. Uh, when I was uh, doing my research on that topic, I, uh, I found uh, his blog on coding habits for data scientists. So uh, I inspired a lot from that. And uh, the things are working on practice, I would say. So a few words about uh, machine learning flow. Uh, this is a diagram from AWS. So yeah, there are several, uh, several stages. We need to fetch data uh, from somewhere. We need to clean it, prepare it, and then train our machine learning models, evaluate them, and then somehow deploy them to, uh, to production. And uh, we can like roughly uh, divide it into two roles, uh, data scientist and data engineer. And uh, kind of ideal world of data scientists, data analysts is to do these uh, two blue things, train models, evaluate them and deal uh, only with that. But in real world, uh, you need to, to deal a lot with data and infrastructure and code things that uh, uh, data scientists are not experts in. And with that, data engineer uh, data engineers helping but at the same time uh, it's kind of end-to-end -end process you to train your model you need to know what's going on from basically from fetching until training so uh, there is an overlapping part uh, in which uh, tight collaboration is needed and that's uh, where software engineering expertise is also uh, useful so yeah I um, as a software engineer, when once I uh, was boarded on a data science team, I understood that uh, yeah, data engineering is the role I would like uh, to do. And by my subjective feeling, the work of data engineer consists of like 73% of DevOps and uh, only like 27% of uh, coding. So uh, actually like this code, uh, code and transformations in uh, entire machine learning solution is not that big, but very important. And 
uh, data scientists and data analysts, as I mentioned, they uh, they would love to deal only with these two blue uh, bars, but they have to also get their hands on uh, software that transforms the data uh, before the training. And actually I received uh, kind of feedback by uh, on, on meetups, on the projects where uh, data scientists, uh, they are coming from very various background. If data engineers are mostly uh, software engineers switched to that role, uh, data scientists, they are, I don't know, they could be uh, coming from astronomy, biology, uh, political science, from a lot of uh, areas. And uh, there is a need of kind of crash course, course of clean code, how to write code uh, correctly, how, how to, yeah, how to write code because their major, major expertise not in that. Um, and their job, as I mentioned, consists of two big, I would say, uh, stages when uh, a model is getting prepared. So there is an exploration, it's kind of POC in our uh, software terms, and then productization. We, we actually need to take this code, uh, make it shippable, and uh, uh, give it to our uh, CI CD things. So uh, I would say that this part of, uh, of coding is like the code is everywhere there, but it's not treated seriously because uh, there are a lot of challenges on uh, other, other levels of that complex uh, systems. And uh, as a result, it has pretty basic uh, issues that we can see in the in code bases of software, uh, but they they are way harder uh, to track down because uh, like standard uh, software disciplines are are not in, in place and, and routines. And uh, I will be talking a bit more about that. So when we talk about uh, code that is doing some data transformations, uh, like the complexity of the system uh, is a bit bigger than we have in software. So we have, of course, uh, complex domains. We have data problems. We have uh, our architecture and uh, special part of it is ETLs infra. Uh, something that doesn't uh, exist in the problematics uh, of software engineers usually. Uh, and then actual design and architecture of, of the code base and actual code. So yeah, usually uh, the, if the error is coming from like one of the, these upper layers, it, uh, it impacts more and it is harder to resolve in code. So kind of uh, my idea of how we, how we approach and attack all these uh, problems is basically going from up to bottom, uh, of course, uh, specifying our agile pro uh, process, uh, practicing domain-driven design in terms of uh, ubiquitous language, it's, very important. Uh, so the, uh, the idea of uh, domain driven design is mostly speeding up our development by building our processes and software around the, uh, the problem, the main problem we are solving. So ubiquitous language allows us to form uh, a vocabulary that is used between business specialists, uh, data specialists, software specialists, uh, without talking about uh, details of uh, databases and uh, other external systems. So we are talking only about domain problems and that that speeds up the commu communication and uh, helps to organize the process. But 
yeah, apart from that, uh, there are uh, there is a part where, if you can see on the on the top, uh, where the data analysis or data science competence is uh, is very important, and only on the very bottom uh, we have our code, which is impacted but by all these uh, layers of complexity and uh, to to write it well, uh, we practice clean code and test driven development. And in terms of XP practices, what we found uh, amazingly if effective is practicing engineer data scientist pairing or data analyst pairing. So when we both sit on the uh, on the part of the code and uh, going through the process that I'm going to be showing a bit later and uh, yeah, software engineer can uh, can see one sort of issues and at the same time if there are some lo uh, logic or data related issues uh, that analysts can pick, uh, pick up. So I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, clean code and TDD process during this presentation. Uh, the be benefits of taking a, a of a good care of your data transformations uh, is of course maintainability. So of course, most of them, or like big majority of uh, models that are created, uh, even when they deploy it, they can be scrapped and uh, deleted. So this kind of uh, feeling of POC is always there, but once we uh, delivered it and once it brings value, we need to maintain it. So we're gonna need to do this cycle uh, again and again. And if we organize our transformations well, uh, this the rep uh, repetition of these first steps uh, gonna be way faster. And what is even more important, uh, the changes in these green bars could be made not by data scientists, but by uh, software engineer or data engineer, which uh, will allow uh, data scientists and data analysts to focus more on uh, data and models and the things uh, that they <laughs> like more. Uh, and of course, reusability. We uh, once we extracted those transformations into granular functions, we will be able uh, to reuse those functions for other models, other projects. Uh, a small pie chart there. It's just demonstrating that yeah, uh, in in software world, uh, most of our time is maintenance, is actually modifying the code we've written. In uh, in machine learning uh, field, it seems like it is also a big uh, a big thing. Uh, but I, I've got the feeling that many stuff is uh, getting scrapped. So um, sometimes there is this choice whether we want to go clean or not. But uh, definitely, uh, it's, it's a good way to go. So yeah, uh, I'll talk a bit about clean code. Uh, a quote that I like and that seems to be very applicable to uh, that data stuff is that, yeah, you know, when you're working with uh, on a clean code, when each routine turns out to be pretty much what you expected. Uh, so the thing is, all those layers of complexity in, um, in combination of uh, not treating code seriously, uh, create a very, very weird uh, things in code that are uh, often uh, really hard to to modify. So they are they are good for POC uh, part, but once it needs adjustment, it's just there are even more layers of complexity that that we have in usual software projects. Um, so talking about clean code, uh, I would say a few words about best practices that we can adopt. So 
uh, areas that definitely uh, works or suggestions that definitely works. We don't want uh, that code or comments in the productized code. Uh, as I will be sh showing, there are a lot of, when we convert uh, things from notebooks to, to actual scripts that we want to deliver, uh, there are a lot of comments and code that prints out stuff uh, for, for the exploration for POC. Uh, yeah, we just want to to leave only uh, that code that brings value in terms of transforming data. Yeah, we should communicate our intent. Intent. Uh, we should use pronounceable names of our variables. Uh, yeah, good name says what it means and means what it says. Uh, very widely used in refactoring legacy code and also productization. Uh, and seems like very useful um, for productization of data science code is uh, exploratory variables. Uh, yeah, just some order in in the names in terms of where, when to use verbs, uh, when nouns, uh, and like two uh, two biggest things that we're gonna be doing. Uh, using exploratory variables and use fun functions to abstract complexity. So talking about that code, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, when we convert notebooks to, to Python, we see a lot of things like that, yeah, which, uh, and value is only in two, two rows. So uh, when we have tests, we can safely remove all this noise and uh, things become way more readable, uh, readable. No comments, so bad when we have uh, obvious comments that are just saying what happens next. We just don't need these comments. Code uh, describes itself. Uh, we should reveal our intent and use readable names. So if there is a comment, ex comment explaining what's in this variable, Let's just rename variable and uh, use this expl explanation right in it. And avoid just like uh, comments are a good tool uh, when there is some tricky decision that was made. Uh, when, when something looks fishy and uh, you add a comment that describes why, why it is like that, but if we just add adding comments around code, uh, they have tendency to be outdated because code gets updated, but uh, it's very, very easy to forget to update comments. Yeah, use of exploratory variables. So if we have uh, some string or a number, uh, it is way more, more readable if we just extract it uh, to a variable and tell what what is it doing? What is for? So we don't need to spend brain, pi brain power uh, trying to understand what's what's there. Uh, our variable names should reveal intent. This is an example from the uh, from the code I'm going to be showing. So on the left, it this kind of an example that is often seen um, in data data code uh, so this is an example of uh, good code uh, kind of it's uh, it's a code that is a learning example for data sci uh, scientists but at the same time uh, when you look at it yeah you need to do these calculations what is what is i what is j and actually when a lot of things are written in one line, uh, often there is a bug. And that's actually what was in this code. So once I started to use uh, better names for understanding what's going on and writing a test, I uh, figure out that, OK, for, for the case, if something is missing, it just breaks. Uh, in these situations, 
also good to have uh, data uh, scientist or data analyst as a pair because we just chat and understand okay it, was it was it just missing or it's by intention because data never gets that shape uh, etc but uh, our variables should uh, should be a tool that helps us to understand uh, what was the intent yeah, so very briefly uh, to the parts of the speech that we're gonna need. We're gonna need to use nouns for variables like median price or age by sex and class, verbs for functions, fill missing prices, convert age to ordinal, etc. Adjectives for uh, enums. Uh, it's not that often that enums are used in, in the data science code since a lot of strings are used there. So probably even adjectives are not needed here. Pre predicates, just a good, a good clean practice to start your predicate from is or should. Uh, so it reads nice in if statements. And avoid noise words like data in for process. Uh, word data <laughs> is used a lot. Uh, we should be finding better. Yeah, that I mean, usually when, when we see data info process, that means that just a person who written this code didn't think about me. Um, so functions are the core of the refactoring that we're gonna be doing. Uh, so they should do uh, one thing only, and they should be pretty, uh, pretty well balanced in a sense they should be big enough to bring some value uh, because if they are trivial we can uh, the, like pandas and other tools that data scientists are using are already pretty descriptive um, so sometimes it's fine to just use uh, a line of one liner from standard tooling but uh, at the same time it should be uh, so it should be bigger, bigger uh, than just trivial. It should bring some value, but still it shouldn't be too big because, uh, in ideal case, we would like to reuse this function not um, only for productization, not only for the code that's going to be deployed somewhere, but also for exploration. Because the more uh, code leaves on production, uh, the more we're going to need to re-explore some things, bugs, and uh, uh, if we can use this function in notebooks that are used for exploration, that's going to be uh, just great. At the same time, exploration has this nature, very chaotic nature, because yeah, we need, you need to, uh, you need very granular control to see what's what is where uh, our the major use of the functions that we have would be to abstract complexity so on the left uh, kind of similar example so you read long notebook and then to understand what's going on with this age guessing you need to read into uh, that kind of complex code and yeah that's pretty usual thing in uh, data science code from my perspective and a lot of stuff is done in one line uh, we need to break the slides and uh, yeah with functions we can just describe as on the right what we are doing we are making some age suggestion matrix we are filling missing age and we convert age to ordinal uh, okay, this one, something wrong with this thing. Ah, yeah. Uh, during refactoring, we can use function names as a tool uh, because if the function already exists and it's just called a no statement, uh, it doesn't give us too much of a clue, but if we rename it uh, with, the, with the help of our ID tools, to something very long and explicit, it's gonna uh, 
tell us that it does more than one thing and what exact thing things it, it does and we're going to be deciding whether we want to keep it like that or maybe we uh, just cut it into small functions uh, so um, we're going to start extracting functions but how do we organize them and there is a special uh, a bit special thing about those transformations. So the code that prepares data, uh, the software that prepares data uh, for model trainings uh, and analysis, it's it's a category of software that's called uh, ETLs, which are extract, transform, and save, and they have pretty consistent structure. So at the beginning of the flow, uh, the data is loaded. Then there is a long flow of uh, transformations when we when we just get one shape of the data and convert it to another shape of the data from data set to data set. And at the end, we save it. So sometimes in the middle, uh, there are requests to some external APIs or more loading, but uh, a lot of code is just uh, uh, interact with uh, external world at the beginning, then pipeline of transformations in memory or in in clusters memory, and then save the results. So I was since I'm big fan of uh, domain driven de development and Onya architecture. I first started to. Uh, think and apply layered approach in the code that I built for data stuff. And it was uh, at the end, I was kind of ending up with the lines, oh, it's, it's not here, where I just instantiating uh, a worker and calling a function of that thing. So. Uh, from one side, uh, the, the layers are not needed uh, because we just we just doing one data transformation after another, and when even trying to abstract things around model training, I've gotten into the uh, situation. Yeah, when when you need to explore things and you need way more flexibility and granularity, so your abstractions are just broken from, from the beginning. So any abstraction uh, that I created for, um, for data transformations and, and uh, model training, they were just outdated and not working on the second model or the uh, second try. So the nature is that you, you do transformations, then you need a bit more transformations to adjust it uh, to the model that you would like to try. And then you try the model, and then can be dozens of models. So um, the layered approach doesn't really work. And from, of course, it it can be created, and uh, that's a first instinct uh, that as software engineer you have uh, when you want when you need to organize uh, code that you see here. Yeah, that's that's just a code that lacks structure and test, et cetera. But um, it, in that case, even on our standard software engineering project, uh, sustaining layered structure is very hard, uh, mainly because there is usually one or two persons who understand this, this structure, who came up with this structure, and they have to actively uh, push have, uh, have to actively uh, put effort into the structure to continue work. Uh, so if they are on vacation for a week, uh, they're going to be pull requests that break the, the layering and uh, um, breaks the initial idea. So it's very energy and efficient. So it's kind of not, not stable equilibrium. And what is worse from my uh, perspective, because I was a 
I remember the faces of data engineers when, oh, sorry, uh, data scientists when I was showing them that sort of code. Uh, their expertise is not, not coding. And uh, they are already loaded with uh, pr pretty serious uh, problems and uh, just adding on the top of it, I know object oriented programming or, or, or something like that, that just uh, won't work. They are already dealing with a lot of complexity. We don't want them to become, I don't know, junior programmers who start uh, do object oriented development. Uh, and of course, when you, when you organize uh, these transformations in objects, it's gonna be harder to reuse them in notebooks where we need like as, as much flexible uh, functions uh, uh, as we can. Um, at the same time, more functional approach when we uh, when we chain our transformations together in a pipeline, seems to be way more readable and way more straightforward to extend because uh, we use very simple rules. If we we need to transform something, we write a small function and then we inject it somewhere in our pipeline and we can uh, reshuffle the transformations uh, as we like. So that's kind of uh, an example of, uh, of, the, of the end state of the productized code. Uh, that's from the, from the example I'm going to, uh, to show. Uh, and in Python, I think there are even tools to make it more functional, but since it is an object-oriented level uh, language, it's a bit tricky, but even like this, it reads pretty straightforward. So you open your top level uh, function, which is gonna be, you know, uh, transform something, and you see what, what happens with the data. And if you need to add another transformation, yeah, you can, you can just insert it, or you can, uh, you can reuse these small uh, things for another, like, transformation class. So in terms of the structure, I would say we don't need classes. Uh, we should avoid object-oriented uh, approach there. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's I would say, my, my opinion. Uh, instead, it's okay to have uh, like classes that are, uh, files that are bags of transformations, uh, each of which is tested with unit tests and more high level, like the usage is the direct usage, direct chain of these functions. And if we can cover these chains and maybe even loading some sample data uh, running through entire chain of transformation, saving and uh, asserting, that would be a good integration test that we should have in our system. So, uh, of course, for real, in real big uh, systems, there are gonna be more lines of uh, these kind of transformations that happen, but it's, uh, it's very explicit what is going on. Of course, we can, uh, we can group them into some high level function, but I wouldn't be going nested too much. I would be having one high level function with the list of the, of the transformations that are happening. Um, and then I'm, if I'm gonna have time, I'm gonna show you how it's organized in the pipeline. So the process of productization that we uh, practiced on our current project and that is in inspired by this blog post that um, I shown at the beginning. So when the exploration is done, it's kind of a big 
a big notebook. Uh, we create a copy of it. We don't want to mess uh, with, uh, with the source. So it already has value. And then there is a tool uh, in Python that allows to convert this notebook into a long, long uh, just script file. Uh, then we write end-to-end -end test for, for that. So we, as, we assume that uh, the shape of the, uh, of the code is correct. So we treat it basically as, as legacy code. We have a huge chunk of the code that we don't know, uh, but it produces some value. So we cover it with end-to-end -end, end -end tests. So wherever it, uh, it produces, on the sample data we uh, run it through, we consider through. So our every time when we doing an extra factoring step, we just run this end-to-end uh, -end test, making sure that we didn't break anything and our and the, and the value is still there. Then there is a big satisfying part of uh, removing noise code that shrinks uh, this huge notebook uh, several times. And then there, there is a refactoring cycle per function. So for each function, we identify uh, where we're gonna be, what, uh, what is this function, what we'll we'll be doing. Uh, in test-driven tradition, write uh, a failing test first, make it uh, pass by creating function for this transformation and just copying the code uh, from notebook Oh, sorry, from the script that uh, that we have, and uh, zoom into this code. And once uh, it's passing and we're happy, we replace the usage of um, of that code in our productized code base and commit the changes. Uh, and it's very important to have it into these small iterations because. Uh, this code base, especially at the beginning, uh, is huge, and yeah, we don't, we just don't want the cascades of changes to happen. And once we went repeated this cycle for many many functions that are there, uh, we can ship the refactored script. Uh, so first, kind of appliances of that flow are a bit painful because we need to extract those functions everywhere. But the more our uh, library of functions is growing, uh, the less cycles here we're going to be needing. Um, yeah, I think we don't have <laughs> time for intermediate Q&A. Uh, I will uh, show uh, the example and then we can get the questions. So I got, uh, I just went to uh, to Kaggle, uh, found the most uh, popular training example there. Looks like community loves it. The guy even uh, written a book uh, related. And I assume this, this example is uh, of walking through data science problem uh, is in this book. Even though the, this, the code is good and clean and very well explained in terms of uh, statistical things that are going on, there were like two, three bugs I managed to catch over there. So some unusual things that we're going to see in this de demo from a software uh, perspective is Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, that's the system which mixes uh, markdown uh, parts of code and outputs of this code. This is a usual way how uh, data analysts and data scientists work. Data frames, instead of models that we use in our software, when we I know, convert DB models to DTOs or, or something like customers and, uh, and companies, etc. cetera, uh, data scientists use frameworks Oh, sorry, data frames, which are basically um, powerful abstractions around tables. So they, um, 
it's okay, yeah it's not it's not that uh, bad as uh, ORMs, but uh, it's it's very very flexible. This flexibility is important, and there is some terminology terminology. Uh, so the names train test uh, DF for data frame. That these are usually standard names. So X train is uh, input for training a model. Y train is uh, expected. I think it expected output or something like this. So unusual things that data folks uh, will see. First of, of all, it is PyCharm. And I would say <laughs> any software engineer that uh, works, which has access to data science team uh, has, to <laughs> has to show them that uh, they can have a better life because uh, they, they work usually in pretty, uh, by software standards, uh, outdated environment. Uh, we, we have PyCharm and it really, it works really well with uh, notebooks and tests and Git, everything integrated together. And like entire cycle that uh, I described previously can be just done in one PyCharm window. And yeah, we're gonna see some software practices in action, incremental ch uh, changes, uh, test-driven design, uh, test-driven development, and working with legacy code. So the final shape, shape of our productized code uh, should look like that. I'm gonna briefly show how it looks uh, before. So it is a notebook, which is very long. And if we uh, we can have um, the code version of it on the left. We can see, yeah, this, it's pretty big. But what is important for us for, for productization is basically this script that's gonna be executed uh, somewhere on, I don't know, on clusters or other. Uh, infra places. So first step of uh, of that is actually uh, creating creating a copy and creating. Yeah. So I have these pre recordings. I'll be probably just launching them and improving the speed. So yeah, that's just work in in PyCharm. We have data from. Uh, from the Kaggle challenge, we have this notebook that is huge. So rerunning it there, uh, making sure that the things are running. So this star means it executes, then it is there. Uh, after that, I was executing this command to generate uh, Python script from the, uh, from the notebook. It appeared over here just moving it up a level and now it's time to write uh, an integration test so yeah this is this is just to show how big it is yeah we would like to return these two data frames so um, in terms of testing and um, the, the outcomes of this script I decided to uh, to go with testing not um, not the outputs of the model, which is accuracy, and it's a bit indeterministic. I think it's fine to go both. I was just testing the shape of the data sets before the training happens, and um, that seems to be. Uh, seems to be good for, for that example. So yeah, so in this huge script, we just wrap everything into a function and then use PyCharm magic altenter to uh, import things automatically, then uh, import pandas and import some more tooling for asserting 
the things, yeah. Uh, so here, let me make pause. So end-to-end -end test uh, first executes this uh, huge uh, script and wherever results on the first run, we consider them as true and just store into pickle. We can store it uh, to CSV. It will be uh, more readable for human, but uh, it, uh, it has problems uh, with conversions when we load it up in memory. Uh, that pandas are pretty intelligent and they try to apply uh, some intelligent uh, typing which breaks the things. So uh, using binary is kind of a compromise to make things fast. Okay. Oh yeah, there was an error. Uh, scores. Classic. And then uh, once the result so first test fails because there are there is no data yet. And then uh, test passes because we are, we uh, we uh, have this kind of approved approved data. Uh, yeah, and then just make a commit of what what just happened. Just picking an error. Uh, oh yeah, and the uh, expected data sets are also added there. Uh, then, really quickly, removing the noise. So, once we have this tool uh, of end to end test, we just go through uh, endless uh, comments and delete them, run the test, see everything working. Uh, just very meditative and uh, satisfying pro uh, process so by, by simple uh, deletion and rerunning the test uh, from like 800 we reduced the script to uh, 200 lines uh, that's pretty encouraging an example of extracting a first function. So yeah, first of all, run the intent test, uh, making sure that everything uh, works. Then reading the, uh, so these comments are basically the markdown left by, by the author of, uh, of the notebook and together with comments around code. So. Uh, since it is a, uh, an example for learning, the comments are, are really good and we can pick up uh, names uh, for the functions from these comments. So I was trying to stick to the terminology uh, that is used in these descriptions. So first, yeah, we extract exploratory variable. Uh, okay, that's, yeah, exploratory variable and see if uh, big test is still passing and then uh, creating uh, a unit test for the function that we gonna extract it. So the function gonna be add title from name. The thing with uh, testing data frames, since it is a table with many columns and yeah, we basically build these functions, but uh, those functions are not usually, uh, is it going back? Oh, how is it going back? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> this is very weird. Um, sometimes these fun functions are uh, gonna have um, if statements, but uh, mostly not. And uh, specifying all the cases of the transformation in a single column or in few columns uh, seems to work. And um, in majority, 
cases, it's for for small function like one one test that covers a uh, few things is enough. Of course, sometimes we need uh, more tests, but for this one, so this function gonna uh, add title from name to our uh, to our data frame. So currently, this uh, file, this function doesn't uh, uh, doesn't exist. So our test is there. It's not running because function is not there yet. Uh, so we create a file with these functions and uh, actual functions, uh, which is basically copying things from uh, from the notebook. And running the test. So something fails, yeah, because there was a mistake. There shouldn't be dots. Yeah, it uh, was the thing. So this notebook is, uh, is a bit unusual because it uh, transforms two data sets uh, simultaneously uh, because Titanic example uh, is is the one that uh, is used for training. Uh, so it's like, so somewhere uh, somewhere before uh, doing machine learning stuff, we need to split our data set into two parts, uh, but this data set is already split. So uh, in here, in this particular notebook, uh, we have places where um, this kind of strange optimization is used like for loop uh, by two data sets. So yeah, I would, I prefer to, to have just like explicitly, if, if it is just two lines, it's the same two lines, but uh, more readable. And uh, then it's gonna help us to just, uh, just to split these things into like training DF step, test DF step. So. So uh, that's basically a thing. There is a useful comment about what's going on with, with regex. And I think I was just moving it to, uh, to the transformation and removing comments that are unrelated. Yeah, and uh, our end-to-end -end test is passing. That means that we can uh, commit the changes. So I think, we are heading uh, to the end of our uh, session. There are many interesting uh, things to show. So the steps that happened was like removing noise code, uh, extracting transformations, uh, fix a bug, uh, and uh, extracting tricky transformation. Mm, I've, I'm thinking about making out of this example, kind of a workshop for data scientists. Uh, sure, let me know if it is somehow interesting, but yeah, I see that we need a bit more time going through this stuff. So making it even more production ready, once we got to this shape of, uh, of the code uh, where uh, we extracted all these functions. So this, this process was repeated again and again and again and again, uh, extracted the functions. There was even some uh, refactoring to make it even more uh, production ready. We can leverage uh, a tool that was open sourced by Netflix uh, called Metaflow. It's actually ETL out of the box. It, uh, it uh, the, the idea is uh, to enable data scientists and data engineers start small just on your local machine, and then it automatically can be uh, turned on, turned into a step function on AWS, or you can uh, execute it in cluster with probably some um, infra wiring around it. But it uh, organizing this code in steps also um, a tool that kind of, <clears throat> sorry, uh, 
cancels the need of uh, of classes because at the end if we if we put things together in this kind of um, pipeline it's already pretty well structured uh, and yeah metaflow takes care of logging i think retries if we fetch some data uh, and parallelization of the steps uh, and yeah just can draw this nice chart of what uh, what we receive so doing this these few steps we, we receive pipeline that is ready to be provided to our cd uh, pipelines and be delivered to our data infrastructure uh, yeah so in conclusion uh, i would say that so the the tips for software engineers so first of all uh, install uh, PyCharm for your data scientists. Uh, my my opinion: data scientists shouldn't be expert in object-oriented programming or hierarchical uh, structures of uh, <clears throat> of the code, and uh, make your uh, data scientists better coders uh, by pairing with them, uh, sharing clean code practices. Uh, helping to test the code and git crash course is also very useful for data scientists i would say uh, it is very uh, useful to have pairing uh, between engineers and data scientists so uh, being proactive in seeking uh, just pairing slots and organizing it it, it seems to be uh, very big value. Uh, ask them to install PyCharm uh, to you uh, on your environment. A mind shift that can be needed is going really small, frequent uh, changes, uh, as I started to show on that demo. Uh, yeah, like this, it is just way more easy uh, to to track uh, the changes and and uh, go and, and progress with stable speed, I would say. And of course, yeah, adopt best practices in naming and test, testing. <laughs>